Welcome to the Greg Henthorne Show. The Greg Henthorne Show is where I talk to writers and creators about their passion, inspiration, and process. To make sure you don't miss an episode, subscribe and click on the bell to turn on notifications. My guest today is Evan Kale. Evan has published three books. We talk about his insights in the creative process. It was a great conversation. I really enjoyed it. Here's Evan. Evan. Hi. <laughs> what? How was that? Frog in my throat. I, I want to talk about your books. What age did you start writing? My first story that I wrote, I mean, I remember I was like seven years old and I had this story about these ants that were yeah. fighting a war in my nature park right by my house. And it was like, it's like a 15 or 20 page story when I was like, just like, you know, seven years old, you know, I could barely write. And I just had a bunch of notebook pages full of this like story. That's the first story I can remember writing. But I just remember like in school, whenever there's a creative writing assignment, it, I always got so excited. It's like, yes, I get to tell one of these stories. So like every time I could, cl I could take a specific creative writing class, I always excelled in it. And I always just loved it. It was always like my favorite hour of the day in school. Why at seven? I mean, seven is a young age to start writing. What, what? Was there a family member or something? Who no, none them? of that. Probably my exposure to movies. Because, you know, that you as a kid, I watched just a ton of movies. Yeah. My dad was way into movies, and, like, every night was a different movie. So you get an idea for the three-act structure and just kind of Wait the art second. storytelling. At seven years old, you had the idea for a three-act structure? Probably, yeah. I mean, I was seeing a lot of movies. I mean, at least getting, like, thinking about telling my own stories. Yeah. Because yeah. I and I would love to, you know, if anything happened, I'd love to tell people about what happened. I just love telling stories. Yeah. It's always been one of my passions. Why? Did you have a storyteller in your life that told interesting stories? My grandma, who I have a lot of influence from, who my parents basically pawned me off on her when they were working and stuff. And so she was like the babysitter they didn't have to pay. She read a lot and she would tell me stories, you know, from back in the day when the world was black and white. And I would just kind of Maybe that kind of influenced me a little bit. I've always enjoyed entertaining, and I find one of my most effective ways to entertain people is to tell them a story. Even if it's a car drove down the street and somebody shouted something, I can turn that into a more, you know, I could, I could contextualize the events in a way that seems to entertain whoever's listening. So writing is a more creative, uh, slower way to do that. You get to use more, you get to really think about how you're telling the story you rather know. than speak it. When you're telling a story, what's the part that, that, that your mind first gravitates to? Is it the action or is it the characters? What's the part that... The action and the villain are always my two favorite things, particularly the villain. I always want to know more about the villain, and I always want to tr strive to create a villain that is truly in their own way evil. Where did you go from there for your first writing? What happened? Mm. So middle school was the first time I took a creative writing class. And actually, I think we had like a C plus or something. The, the teacher was a dick. He didn't like my writing or my stories and stuff like that. But like, I just remember I always enjoyed the different assignments, but I would always get annoyed with creative writing. It was never just write a story. It's always, you know, write a fairy tale or like write like a specific kind of story or do something specific that limited my creativity. And I never liked that. Yeah. So I always wanted to tell stories like on my own. And sometimes like, I would attempt to start writing a book as a kid. It was like, you know, I was like a teenager and like I would never get very far because it's just like a big process. And then when I uh, was in college, I started writing screenplays and I just I developed this whole ambition of like wanting to break out and be a screenwriter and a movie producer. And I like I seriously spent like 10 years chasing that thing like a dog after a car. And ultimately it didn't pan out. I got pretty close. I had an uh, I had a manager in L.A. at one point to represent me. But no, it's really hard to break into screenwriting and it's a different process. But again, the storytelling was the angle that I was trying to go to. I wanted to tell my own stories and, you know, like I'd go and see movies and I'd watch them and I'd think, you know, I would do it differently or like, I wish I could, I wish I could see this one kind of story that I'm not seeing. So those are the kind of stories that I wanted to tell. But screenwriting, you know, it's way different than writing books. And I always wanted to write a book and I never did. And then once I got burned out with screenwriting, I pivoted to books and it's, Glad I did. Do you see your storytelling as uh, trying to tell the correct version of the way you wish things were or as retelling the, in other words, even in fiction, there's sometimes an element of, of biography or, right. or, or of corrective nature. Like, I, you know what? I don't like the way things are. So I'm going to tell stories where things are correct as I perceive them. Well, that's a good question. I guess it kind of depends on the world because I do like, 
you know, I've got this book series about Nazi hunters and I'm doing that in a way that is very untraditional and I'm not like it basically wouldn't happen the way that the way that I have my story. Like, it's just like not possible with politics back then. But I just steamroll over that. It's like, no, this is my world and I get to tell it my way and I don't have to apologize for the rules that I make. When I tell nonfiction, I mean, I've only written two nonfiction books, but no, it's it's no dressing down of anything. It's dressing up and glorifying everything that's a problem or everything that I think needs to be spoken about. Like my nonfiction books are about Uber and Lyft. So I use my personal experiences and my stories to highlight everything that's, that's wrong with Uber and Lyft and, you know, just kind of be like, hey, like there's all these problems that nobody really talks about in, in the news. Did you write as you were doing it? Is this how it all yeah. came about? Well, what I did was I kept a diary. So it was like a little black book. Yeah. And I knew that I was going to be writing these books about Uber and Lyft like a week into driving. I didn't I got into write or I got into doing Uber and Lyft so that I could write and work on my screenplays between rides. But it was like, oh, God, I've stumbled onto the best vehicle for writing a pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> stumbled on the best vehicle for writing a book. I got to keep a diary. So like, yeah. you know, I would. I would drive late at night and when something crazy would happen, I would jot it down right after it happened. Sometimes I'd be sitting at a red light and the customer would just be insane in the back seat doing something. I'd be sitting here like this and like, are you writing something? No, <laughs> no. Keep talking. <laughs> you made one book or two books? Three two books. books. Two books. Two books. Yeah. Ubered. Uber and my, as a ride uh, share. Ubered and life as a rideshare driver. Yeah. And Ubered too. Actually, hang on one second. All right. All right, pause, bear with me. I should have done this as a setup. All right, so the books, you have them behind you. What is the Ubert and Uber 2? Uh, where does the name come from? The verb is Uber. It's it's like the Kleenex of rideshare. I All would right. be I'd be driving people in a Lyft ride. Yeah. And yeah. the phone would ring and they'd be, you know, they'd be talking to the person they're going to see and say, Hey, I'm in the Uber on the way to you now. I'm Ubering to you right now. And it's like we're in a Lyft ride. We just talked about how you don't take Uber. Why are you using that verb? So, you know, Uber was the one. They, there's a little bit of a chicken and egg between the two yeah. who came first because they both kind of rose up at the same time yeah. from different. Or like, there's like this common idea of how do we revolutionize cabs in the early 2000s. And Uber and Lyft kind of came about at the same time. It's just, you know about Uber more than Lyft because they were more audacious. They got in more trouble. Their PR was more or yeah, their their yeah. image was more out there than Lyft was. So they just became the more recognizable of the two. So, and therefore, so, the nomenclature took effect. Yeah, so I know. I tell my friends I'm Alta Visting things, and, <laughs> and they never they <laughs> really seem to get it. The So you started you taking notes, writing stuff down, and this became, and you knew there was going to be a book. At what point did you start uh, Putting what you had written into a, you know, typing, going through and typing out your notes. You do that weekly, daily. How did you do that? I started trying to write something right away, and I actually I wrote probably forty thousand words of something that I just ended up throwing away. I didn't like what I was doing. I was attempting to deconstruct where they came from and how we got to where I got in the driver's seat, or like how you know all this happened and came about. And I just didn't like what I was doing there. I thought, no, this is better as a human story, where it's just ride to ride, short story, short story, short story. Some of them are a page, some of them are 10 pages long, some of the rides. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I started right away and then I threw it out and then I started again. I got hit by another Uber driver while I was working and it turned my life upside down for about three oh, weeks. So it is insane how Uber kicks their drivers to the curb in yeah. extreme situations like this. So I was so mad. That was when I started writing the first draft of this. Like I just had fire in me. Really? Yeah. Um, Have so, your other writing projects uh, correlated around some sort of personal animus? Yeah. Angry uh, situation, animus, uh, irritation, excitement, enthusiasm. Maybe maybe this just says something about me. And I actually haven't th really thought about this. My, my novel, my only fiction book that's out right now is called Wolf in the Jungle. And, you know, I don't know how much yeah, you want to talk about that. We'll get but, to it. This is a direct result of Charlottesville. Yep. This is a Jew who was outraged that there were Nazis marching in the street and wanted to tell a story saying, you know, screw you Nazis. So I started right like I had begun writing this in 2016, like right after I finished the first Uber book. Yeah. And then I stopped working on it for a while because, like, you know, my life got kind of chaotic and I just put it aside. But then Charlottesville happened and I was so outraged I started writing again. And that just really? that gave me fire to finish it. How long did it take you to write each one? First draft, about six months. 
And about what does that what does that look like? How many words per week, or how many? What was the pace you set for yourself? Trying to just finish the project within six months. So the novel's shorter. These Uber books are about a hundred thousand words each, and the novel's sixty five thousand. So it's quite a bit shorter. Mm -hmm. So with the novel, pacing myself, trying to do a chapter a day kind of thing. Obviously, that wasn't real. It's like 40 chapters. And like I said, it took about six months. Words or how many How many chapters? How many words in a chapter? Oh, boy, that varies. 1,500, 2,000. Okay. Yeah. What? what I, hear, I hear Stephen King does 10,000 a day, and that seems crazy to me. Yeah. I don't know how he does it. But I've heard, you know, I've also heard Eric Larson, who's my personal favorite author, does 500 in a writing session, and that's a good session for him. 500? Uh, 500, yeah, but I mean, he really? seems to yeah. write with extreme care and yeah. use, like his use of wordage is just very careful. Yeah. So I can see how that works. I don't read a lot of Stephen King, so I can't really speak to his writing. I didn't until I did the Stephen King on writing book, and then I, and that made me, that turned me on to listening, which is what I do for a lot of fiction. I'd like to read The Shining because it's one of my favorite movies, and I know yeah. he despises the movie, and there's a ton of Easter eggs in the movie that are just like, Stanley Kubrick giving the middle finger to Stephen King. Yeah. So what's the, your writing habit when you're not in a, when you're not in a project, are you writing all the time when you're not in a project? Are you? Well, cause like, I get burned out sometimes. I'm like, I'm really busy with other, other stuff. And I, I put so much effort into my writing, like particularly the screenwriting and it just, it truly went nowhere. And I made like no money off of it and spent a bunch of money. So it, when it kind of started becoming about money is when it stopped being fun. And I, I burn out way easier than I used to. So I just, I'm working on a sequel to my Nazi Hunter book. And I have now finished the first draft, but I had a three month period, like, you know, during quarantine, I should have been working on it, but I just wasn't, my head wasn't in the space to do it. And I just was kind of tired from working on it because I worked on it for like five months. How do you get so yourself? I go, in, I go in spurts. Yeah. So how do you get yourself into the place where you're actually going to pro be producing? I have to really get excited about the story. And if I just start getting writer's block or like I just get start getting frustrated with where the story has taken me, like I kind of wrote myself into a corner on the sequel and I, it took a while to figure out how to get out of that. Ultimately, it's a dream sequence. Up. It's a dream sequence. <laughs> Not that much of a cop out. I actually ended up having to just rewrite and, and throw some stuff out. Yeah. But I do like I will easily throw stuff away and just start again. Sometimes it's easier to do that. Like I said, I wrote 40,000 words of the Uber book. And then I just was like, I can do better. I want to do better. I want to do something else. This isn't it. When did you learn <laughs> the value of being able to trash your own stuff? Because Probably. one of the things that's really hard for a lot of first for when people first start is like, oh, you know, everything that drips from this from my pen is pure gold. How dare I get rid of it? Uh huh. Yeah. No, that's not the case. <laughs> I wish I was that audacious. Maybe I'd be a little more confident with some of my storytelling because sometimes it's like hesitation. will be like, well, do I really want to go there? And like, I'll overthink it. It's like, I probably should have just written it and seen what happened. No, probably actually with art is where I learned to throw stuff away. I took drawing and painting in high school. My teacher there was like one of the best educators I've had in my life. And, you know, taught me about a lot about painting and painting was repainting and adding more colors and just like, don't be afraid to throw stuff away and start again. If it's not good, you can't fix it. Maybe you can do better. So I do that on paintings. If I'm not liking a painting or like where it's at, I will just throw black all over the canvas and start again. And in that probably is where I learned to just, you know, be like everything that's a rough draft is just that it's rough and yeah. it's muddy clay. You're sculpting it, but sometimes you got to peel bits off and throw it away. When you're looking at a finished book and you're holding it, are you, do you feel pride or does it is it or do you feel contempt or is it sometimes a mixture of both? That curiously is my favorite aspect of writing is being able to say done and print it out and just like wow I there it is there's the story there's what I've been working on for six months it's done. Yeah. My favorite process with writing is actually editing. The second draft is where I have fun because the hard part's done and now I get to clean it up. You know sometimes I cringe because it's like oh this is like just poorly I have to rewrite this whole chapter. But it's fun to, to retell it. Like, maybe this just says something about me, but I love telling myself my own stories that I've come up with and be like, yeah, like, that's a good story. Like, I'm really liking what I'm co I've come up with. I'm very excited about the story. I'm very passionate about it. So like this, this book that I'm working on right now, I've just hit that point where I've gotten the hard part done. I've muscled myself through the first draft. It's done. I'm cleaning it up. And I'm really excited about the story I came up with. And that's, that's a good feeling. That's cool. 
I don't, I, you know, it's fascinating because I do not know anyone who's ever said that, well, learning it from art is unusual, but also this idea of really looking forward to the second draft. I mean, people do it because they know they need to do it, but they don't, they haven't learned to embrace it. And that is a peculiarly uh, good thing. Can you talk more about that process? What makes you look forward to it? What makes you enthused enough to say, you know what, I've read this thing nine times because I was the one that wrote it. And now it's boring to my brain. But yet you still engage with enthusiasm. So that's unique. Yeah, that ties back into art and uh, painting. One of my favorite aspects with painting is you just keep adding layers and layers and layers and you clean stuff up and you bring life out into, into whatever it is you're painting. You do that with your writing too. You read something, like you print it out on paper. That's what I do on my second draft is I always print it out and I go through it on paper because you just you totally miss things on a screen. It reads way differently on paper. So mm-hmm. in going through it on paper and being able to, to just bring life to it is very satisfying. What do you do when you got a finished book and, and your your and your friend comes to you and goes, Oh yeah, did you see that on page forty seven you misspelled there? Hmm. Yeah, I mean that's why that's why I have my friends, the ones who are down to, because believe it or not, it is actually pretty hard to get your friends to read your stuff. Yeah, yeah. But I've got a couple that read my that read my first drafts or my I'm sorry, not my first drafts. I don't let anybody read those. My second, third drafts I do. And then they tell me, You misspelled this, this is bad, you gotta fix this, this, that, that, that. I'm very aware of that. And it's like, you know, and like, so I do go through it again and again, and I run my drafts through Grammarly yeah. chapter by chapter. And I really try as hard as I can to catch everything. I can't catch everything, yeah. but you yeah. know, it's close. Yeah. Um, I, it's, it's a level where I'm comfortable with it. And if I do catch something later, cause I publish on Amazon, you can go through and, and fix it and just upload the fix. Yeah. And that's, yeah. then it's good. That's the- what, what I don't like is, Cleaning up a draft or like after you print, because I did this with my first Uber book, Mm -hmm. I was really angry when the first Uber book came out. Like I just had a lot of like very raw emotions and very extreme opinions that I don't necessarily feel now. Mm -hmm. And they were to the point where some of them were like just kind of cringeworthy. And there's, yeah, there's a couple hundred copies that are out there of like my really intense version. And I'm like not embarrassed about it, but it's like kind of, it's not reflective of my persona. Yeah. And yeah. so I clean that up and like I have a new draft that's Do you write mostly at night? What are the yeah, hours really, you write? What are your writing hours? Very late at night, usually when I'm stoned. <laughs> that is part of the writing process with me. I yeah, midnight, one AM, two AM. I try and you know, when I sit down to write something, I'll start with I'll start with a raw story. Yeah. In my head, whatever it is, if it's fiction, nonfiction. If it's fiction, I imagine a movie trailer. And I go from there and I picture different scenes in this movie trailer and i try and figure out what did i just picture and how do i make like how do i tie all this random stuff that just occurred in my head together right now if you had to give one piece of advice for someone who wants to start writing they got a, they have a dream of doing what you've done and that is continue to, to put out books what would be your piece of advice for them what would be the one thing you would say do not let agents, manage, managers, and publishers damper your opinion or damper your writing at all. You have the means to put stuff out right now and start making money thanks to Amazon. That's the best way to go about doing it, by my experience, because I'm a person. My books have great reviews. I have to talk myself up, but people seem to like what I'm putting out. And I've been rejected by every agent, every manager, except for my screenwriting, and every publisher. Like, no publisher wanted these books. So, you know, and it's it, 10, 15 years ago. That meant the door was closed on you. Yeah. Either that or you had to sink ten thousand plus dollars into getting your own copies and going to trade shows and like forget that. What a nightmare. So that's no longer the case. So just write for you. Be confident. Put your stuff out there. You have the means to do so. Do the best job you can. It's a self-published book. You're not going to make a lot of money, but you're telling your stories and you're getting it out there, and that's all that counts. That's awesome. Well said, Evan. Thank you very much. I look forward to talking to you again. This has been good. My pleasure. Thank you for having me on, Greg.